some of the things I was doing as a camera operator on Days of Heaven were very much in the new style of the American film of the 70s. A lot of handheld work, which came directly out of the French New Wave. But it was still very much against the grain of the classical American style. And it was still very odd to be done in a film like Days of Heaven because uh, most of the, a lot of the early uh, American New Wave films were urban films. They had kind of a tough edge to them. They were not pastoral films. So some of the things that seemed so startling about Days of Heaven was that it was your classic American costume period film, and yet it was being shot in a very contemporary style. It was being shot with all of the conceits and all of the metaphors that the American street films were being shot at the same time. Nestor, who operated a lot of his own films in France, was not used to using a camera operator. And I was so flattered and surprised at how readily he allowed me to, to be involved, you know, in all the discussions and everything. But that was Nestor. He was a very open and kind of generous person and wanted everybody to contribute. As a camera operator, on a functioning basis, my dialogue and information came very much from Nestor. But, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that, that the source of all of that and, and the vision for how all of that uh, would unfold, you know, came from Terry. I mean, obviously, he wrote the script. He had the vision of the material, the whole sense of how these characters move in space and time and interact with nature. I think that temperamentally, Nestor and, and Terry Malick were very similar. I think they're both very gentle, poetic, and quiet people. And neither of them worked well in a kind of frenetic kind of pressure cooker atmosphere and so it was a perfect combination because also the, we were shooting you know 45 minute drive from Lethbridge Alberta we were out in Hutterite land in the middle of nowhere it was very isolated we were surrounded by nature and you know not nature as dramatic as what you see in the film but nonetheless it was nature and it kind of created its own bucolic sense which was very congenial, I think, to the temperament that Nestor and, and Terence had. We all had the feeling that we were working inside a larger context. I mean, we had all of this equipment. And a lot of times when you have all this equipment in an urban environment or in a more, you know, kind of smaller environment, the equipment seems very grand and important and big. But against the landscape of you know, the Alberta plains there in the wheat fields, all this equipment was just like, you know, dot on a piece of paper. It created in all of us, I think, a sense of perspective about just how small we were in the scheme of things, which is one of the great themes of the film itself. You know, in a sense, the vanity that humans have to think that we make such a large difference because ultimately the cycle of nature is so much bigger than any of us. You look at Terry's other films, and there's a tremendous sense of impression, of fragmented moments that even the dramatic scenes themselves do not necessarily follow conventional structure of revealing dramatic dialogue. It's more fragmented and impressionistic. And so the, the character-driven and dialogue scenes are very much of a piece I think in, in all of Terry's work, with the visual fragmentation uh, and the use of what uh, you know people call second unit work. The second unit work in Days of Heaven is really first unit. In the middle of the fire scene, you have all these shots of the locusts backlit by the fire, and they're very, very inserty type shots and yet they have the same kind of dramatic impact that those big wide shots of the, of the, the rolling fire coming you know, toward the people that are fighting it. 
That is really a brilliant conceptualization that Terry could take the microcosm and make it part of the macrocosm. The bulk of the camera body was no longer a factor in how you had, had to work. So it made for a very kind of free, loose shooting. The camera we used was an early model of the Panaflex, which was a tremendous leap forward in camera design. And the way that Nestor and Terry wanted to work by moving quickly from one place to another as the light changed and kind of be spontaneous as we would see things happen or catch something on the fly, uh, it, it was a perfect camera to be able to do that. It was possible to handhold it, and it was self-blimped. It was very quiet. You could shoot dialogue in a room like this with it, and it was really the only camera that you could shoot in a quasi-documentary style and do direct sound. Eric von Haaren Norman came as the Panaglide operator, and the Panaglide was Panavision's version of Garrett Brown's Steadicam. And it was new, and there were very few people that could use it. And he came and executed some of the more, you know, intricate shots, some of the things on the river, so forth, where the camera really had to have kind of a floating sense rather than the kind of quality of the handheld work. It was an early use of it, you know, and it, it was a kind of a bridge between the traditional photography with the with the, the the dollies and the cranes and the handheld work. It was still a very new thing, and cameramen were still trying to test how do you use it. What's the vocabulary, the grammar of it here? Today, it's so well integrated that a lot of times you can't tell the difference between the Steadicam and the Dolly. I mean, they, they intercut so beautifully. But at that time, early on, uh, a lot of people used it only for a very spectacular kind of very complicated shots where you'd walk up and down stairs, things that you couldn't possibly do either handheld or with a Dolly. In Days of Heaven, none of the shots are terribly, terribly complicated in terms of spectacular Steadicam Panaglide shots, but they're really important. It was not true that we didn't use lights. I mean, the interiors uh, almost always had lights. There are a number of scenes that were done under cover of shade or inside a barn that had a north light, a very soft light that remained constant. But, you know, any time you see an extended scene where you have a dramatic light coming in, like a window or something like that, in order to maintain the continuity of that light, it has to be an artificial light because the sun is constantly moving. And as a watch in the night, as soon as that scatters, The exteriors on Days of Heaven were largely available light, and they were shot in backlight. So when you're shooting in backlight, not only do you get the rim around the head that is very dramatic, and the sun hitting the ground behind you is very bright, but the light doesn't change. As long as you keep it in backlight, the light on the front of the face is going to be very down and soft. Now what happens normally is traditionally cameramen will fill very softly the front of the face in backlight so that the back won't overexpose too much, won't burn out. A lot of times we were shooting in the wheat fields or in ground that was already brightly lit, so you got a certain amount of bounce light coming up off the ground that filled in the face and gave very beautiful natural kind of highlights. If you had supplemented that by extra artificial light, it would have washed it out. So a lot of the very delicate highlights that you see on the faces in backlit scenes that are so effective that make it seem so real would not have been there had Nestor used supplemental light. <laughs> the fact that the light was constantly changing 
is not really a crucial element because the film not only is impressionistic, but there are very few lengthy scenes. And a lot of the scenes were actually done late in the afternoon, if not at magic hour. And so sometimes in the middle of the day when the light was pretty much overhead and was not very beautiful to shoot, we would either shoot under cover in a barn or a north light situation, or we would rehearse three or four scenes. We would position where we thought the camera would go, drive a stake in the ground, rehearse the scene, pick the limbs, get everything ready. If it were a dolly, we would lay the dolly track, this all during the height of the day. And then when the sun started to drop and we got closer to the magic hour, we would run like hell from one place to another. Terry had the actors rehearsed, the camera moves were all planned, we knew what we were doing, and we would like do one or two takes here, then we'd move the camera one or two takes here. And with that long twilight magic hour in southern Alberta in summer, we would have like a 40 minute magic hour period instead of 12 or 15 minutes. And we were able to, you know, shoot a number of scenes every night that way. So much fun. I love you, okay? I want you to be really good. And I want you to do anything wrong. If you do that wrong, I'll come back and get you. At that time, there was no film that was directly balanced for daylight. When you shot in daylight, you had to use a warming filter. The film was balanced for tungsten light at 3200 Kelvin. So you always had this sort of salmon-colored filter when you went outside, and that took up almost a full stop of light. Now, as it got darker and you ran out of light, you could pull that filter out and gain extra shooting time. And that's what we did a lot of times. And that's why a lot of the scenes are so very, very deeply blue. Not only is it because the sky was blue in that late, but when you pull that filter, it intensified the blue even more. We shot a number of days well after sunset, well after the normal magic hour. And of course, as the sun sets in the west, the western sky is the last to lose even the deep blue light. And Nesta would keep shooting well after the light meter would indicate, you know, there's nothing left. And Terry would always encourage, Nesta, let's just shoot it. You know, I mean, it's just a, a shot. Let's shoot. Who knows what it's going to, maybe it'll be great. And a lot of times it was. A lot of times the stuff would come back and we could barely see each other, but, and there was no detail in the actors, but the sky behind had enough to silhouette them. The sequence of the locusts, normally it had been done in visual effects, but I think Nestor came up. Maybe it was Nestor and Terry, but I know Nestor was instrumental in deciding you know, that we could do that in, uh, in actual production. And I remember we, we had the Panaflex with a reverse running magazine. It was back loaded on the take up side, ran the camera backwards so that what happened was there was a plane that came by, was full of peanut shells that were painted black. And so they were all coming down on the ground, but since the camera was running backwards, it looks like they're rising up into the air. And we had the actors also reverse their motion. I remember that we rehearsed it uh, very carefully. At that time, whenever you would have an effect like a dissolve or a fade, you always had to cut in duped pieces of film in the middle of the shot. And you can recognize that effect is coming right away in films of that period because it gets very grainy and soft and, you know, dupey, as they say. Nestor and Terry wanted to avoid telegraphing what were effects. So a lot of them were actually done in the camera. The fire sequence, I think if it were done today, would be done with a lot more control, a lot more fire people around, permits and things like that. 
It was kind of a freewheeling time, and I know there were perimeters set and fire breaks set and everything, but you can see very clearly there are times when the flames kind of sweep very fast, and you see some of the extras that are supposedly trying to put it out actually turn and run. And I remember a couple of times I was hand-holding a camera that I had to turn and run as well because uh, uh, it was very unpredictable and there was no lighting. It was all shot with the existing firelight. It was incredibly frenetic. There was just a lot of yelling and screaming and people running around. And you can see, you know, it's cut in a very impressionistic way. It was shot in a very impressionistic way. There were some areas where you can actually tell it's a controlled burn. There are certain little cutaways where there's a small area of grass that's on fire and there's six or eight extras there with bags trying to beat it out. But that wall of flame that comes at you at one point, that was not very controlled as I recall. It was just coming at us. I think in retrospect, it was probably a lot more dangerous than any of us realized at the time. As much as I remember on Days of Heaven, a sense of us all working in a kind of a free collaborative spirit, there were certain members of the crew that were very much came out of the old guard Hollywood establishment. And we had a very good, wonderful uh, key grip who had worked with Harry Stradling a lot. And Harry Stradling was the son of Harry Stradling Sr., one of the great legendary Hollywood cinematographers. And, and Harry Stradling Jr. himself had a very prestigious career in the mainstream of traditional Hollywood big films of the, of the 60s and early 70s. And this key grip was used to working with a lot of equipment, big silks up when you were outside to soften the sun, a lot of fill light, a lot of constructing of platforms and things like this, reflectors to fill light. Nestor didn't use any of that. The truck, you know, would pull up in the morning and they'd open the doors and start to pull stuff out and Nestor would say, I don't need any of that, you know. And so the key grip Tommy May would just sit around, the guy that sit on the tailgate of the truck, you know, scratching their heads, wondering when they were going to be able to do something. And uh, I, I remember one day we were shooting one of those backlit scenes where there was no fill light at all. And uh, Tommy May came up to me and he said, hey, John, uh, you know, Harry would never do it like this. He'd just never do this. A number of months later, after Nestor had won the Academy Award for his cinematography, I saw Tommy May on the lot at Paramount. And he hailed me and I went over to him and I said, Tommy, you were right. Harry would have never done it like that. One of the shots that still stays with me and I, every time I see it, I just, it moves me very deeply, is the crane shot that starts with the caravan all along the dirt road and it then starts to pan with them as they go through the entrance gate of the ranch and then cranes up and you see the house in the background. And it's just one of these sort of heroic grand shots, you know, and we were on a Titan crane. And I remember when we were doing the rehearsal and as the crane started to go up and I was sitting on it, I just, I said, you know, this is one of those moments that I know I will always think back on. And after we did the first take and it worked out very beautifully, we came down and, uh, you know, it was a fairly warm day, uh, but I had goosebumps on my arms and Nestor said, are you cold? And I said, no, Nestor, I'm not cold. It was just that kind of a shot. Days of Heaven was both a finishing point for me you know, creatively and also a jumping off point. Because for me, it represented the fulfillment with, with Nestor of a lot of the hopes and ideas and thoughts I had had from film school on to when I started of finding the American new wave film. I think that the Days of Heaven really caught that. And I was aware of it at the time, so when we finished the film, I felt, aha, 
I've been a part of that and I can move on.